Hi, Rosalind. Thank you for joining me. Hello. It's an honor. Thank you so much. Uh, so there's a lot we can talk about today. I'm interested in your background and your teaching of yoga and also some of the things that I've seen you say on Twitter about relationships <laughs> and sexuality. And there's a lot here that I think we can dive into. Uh, but I'd love it if you started just by sharing your own background and history and where you're coming from and how you got to where you are today and in whatever length that you'd like, short or long, just sharing your story <laughs> as you see it today. Wow, what an invitation. Okay, I'll try and do a short version and um, maybe relevant to what I enjoy presenting, like how those perspectives came about this moment in time. So uh, you might have read me write about that I used to be quite an intense environmental activist. <laughs> that was one of my first incarnations. Uh, I mean, you could go back further than that, but that was maybe one of the starting points of this particular journey. And I was working for Greenpeace for direct action groups in New Zealand, offshore flotilla sailing protests and things like that. Uh, I'd had some kind of a feeling of love and concern for the planet. And the only obvious place to channel that uh, was into different activist activities that were offered to me. But I kept getting more and more frustrated with the cultures that I found myself in. Um, with, they weren't offering people any tools to resolve their own issues to make them more effective. They were often at the bottom of the cliff dealing with symptoms of a culture that was creating these problems and not really intervening in that culture itself and often duplicating it is what I saw. Um, and that kind of came to a head for me when I did uh, three months on the Rainbow Warrior as a crew member. And I was so excited and honored. It was like a dream come true. And that time was extremely difficult. It, I found it extremely ineffective. Uh, I mean, I had a very critical mind, but even to me, it was <laughs> uh, frustrating, wonderful people, really special people, special relationships, and yet I could feel it wasn't the right place for me. It was, uh, yeah, the bottom of the cliff, and people were really suffering, even on that context. I'd created a utopia imagination. I think we all go through that stage of looking for a place where all the people are sorted and we can just relax and we don't have to <laughs> engage and actually um, do anything ourselves <laughs> in terms of that cultural shift. Uh, so that was really the force that pushed me into spirituality or exploring. Okay, I know that I'm neurotic. I know that I'm not functioning the most... Uh, best use of my gifts and my skills. I know that I'm somehow embodying these toxic elements of culture that I've grown up in. I can see these patterns of overwork and productivity obsession and unhealthy uh, sexual relationships, etc. I need to see if I can figure this out. Um, so that was what pushed me to exploring. And I went to yoga classes, you know, the usual downtown classes, me and a friend would go to a different one every Friday night and then get dinner. We'd call ourselves yoga sluts. And it just that was just what was on offer. It was very gymnastic, often with a little sprinkling of some Sanskrit or something on the top, like sprinkles on a cupcake. And I liked it. It moved me, but it didn't really create any transformation. And there was definitely an unconscious sense that it was a slightly flippant or fun activity and not really for serious people. <laughs> Probably that was the unconscious image I had. So I, I shifted to an ashram that was way in the kind of WAPs of New Zealand, as we say. Probably about six hours drive from the nearest big city. And uh, again, like searching, searching, 
And I lived there for a couple of years off the grid of my own little place. And it was very freeing to get out of the normal life and the normal work in some ways. But I continued to play out my patterning. I continued to have the same issues of relating with authority. And uh, I guess you could describe that place as a um, kind of a Advaita Vedanta or a modified Advaita Vedanta. So it was very much focused on uh, satsang and, and discourse and understanding, but without any real practices to put those ideas into, into practice, into actuality of relationship. And what I saw is just people, including myself, going nutty. <laughs> We'd taken out like normal, idealistic, goal-seeking personalities, and we just applied them to these surreally out of reach spiritual goals and then we're just carefully watching each other and monitoring each other to see how we failed with that <laughs> and um, of course there were some beautiful times but the overall dynamic was defined by uh, search the search the uninspected search for something that wasn't lacking and one day at the tiny little shop called the bush fairy dairy where i lived which was the only sign of a town. There was one store. Uh, I picked up a secondhand book, and that book was called Yoga of Heart by some guy called Mark Whitwell. And I started reading it. I was really broke at the time, so I thought about shoplifting it, but I didn't. I paid $8. <laughs> and um, I looked at the picture at the back, and there was this guy in the photo, like not smiling but with quite a stern but dignified look in the photo. And I just thought, wow, I have to meet this person. It was a really strong feeling. And uh, so I got online, I searched. He, had, he was a New Zealander, but he had no trainings or classes offered in New Zealand. So I looked up the closest one and it was in Fiji, actually in the same room that I'm sitting in now. <laughs> and... I emailed the assistant and asked, and it was completely out of my price range. It was, I didn't know at the time that if I had asked, I could have gone for free. I didn't know that. <laughs> and, what, and so I started saving. I made a budget. I got like two extra part-time jobs. I sold my car. I sold my furniture. I sold all my fancy clothes from when I used to work in the film industry. And I still didn't have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> so my friend lent me a thousand dollars extra which was just enough to top me up and off I went to Fiji to learn yoga and I arrived and I was a bit of an asshole to be honest I was a bit of a snob I thought I was more sensitive and spiritually superior to the other people I developed some ability to sense tension in people but was just being a really judgmental asshole with that ability mm. uh, <laughs> And I announced proudly that I wasn't really into the asana side of things, that I was more into contemplation and these kind of more noble type things. And I didn't really realize it at the time, but I was just playing out that age old split of mind and body, the superior mind over the assumed to be lesser material, you know. And uh, I just realized as soon as I met Mark that we just got on like a house on fire. So I said to him, hey, I really liked your book, but it had a lot of typos in it. That was our first conversation. <laughs> and uh, I thought he took it well. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was working as, as a proofreader at the time online. So that's what qualified me to be so mean. <laughs> and he said, well, how about we work on a new one then? And I thought, oh, okay. And I accepted so after the training was finished, I flew back to Auckland and he was back in Auckland as well to see family. And so we met up to work on the book project. And I was very excited to be working on this project. But I very soon realized that it was just an excuse to be hanging out with him. I, was, I, was, I did want to work on the book, but I was more excited than just a book project would warrant. And um, so I just, I mean, it's, hard for me even to remember but it was so I was just not thinking there was no brain involved 
I surprised myself is I just asked him if he was interested in being in a relationship with me. And it turned out that my feeling was mutual. And so here we are four years later and uh, married. <laughs> mm. wow. So it's really been the relationship that has shaped the direction of my life. And I think that I knew it from when I first saw that photo. Mm. And of course, you know, when you see someone's photo, you don't just see them as a person. You also see their lives of practice and their tradition and everything that they embody. So it's not just an attraction to a personality, it's an attraction to yoga itself, you know. And uh, we were traveling for the last four years, well, three years, and then until COVID hit, we were just on the road all the time in US and Canada, in Europe, the UK, in the Middle East and China, Japan, Thailand, Singapore, Bali, India, <laughs> Tibet, Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji. So uh, I was the hermit who said, I'm not interested in travel. I don't want to travel anymore. <laughs> I'm completely satisfied to live in my little house here. <laughs> Ironically, the universe ends up having me on a plane every two weeks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, you're welcome to ask any more detail. That's the rapid summary, I guess. Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned you'd listened to the other podcast we did the other day on William Blake. And mm -hmm. I would really say that that's the other important part of my story is uh, studying William Blake literature. I did my master's in, in Blake back in finishing in 2015 or something, 2014. And I would call Blake my guru, really. It's a special relationship. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, that's a really terrific, terrific conversation that River did with you to dive into that deeper. Um, so yeah. So over the last four years or so, um, how, like you've started to teach the form of yoga that you learned from Mark. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, pretty rapidly, actually, as soon as mm -hmm. I went back to New Zealand after just a few weeks here, I did not imagine that happening. Um, but, you know, when you read autobiography of a yogi and um, Paramahansa Yogananda, he often speaks about showing people Kriya Yoga quite mm -hmm. rapidly and then sending them off to practice for the next 80 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. So to me, yoga is like that, that the actual technology of asana, pranayama, is very simple and you can learn it probably in a couple of hours, but then you have to actually do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to be a teacher, you have to know how to share, but the most important thing is that you actually do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you do it yourself, then you can teach anybody who hasn't learned that yet. You mm -hmm. can share that because you're not trying to um, share information like you don't have to have this vast amount of information you just have to have enough to set them on their way of their own path and their own explore, exploration and usually as a support to whatever other culture or religion or no religion they're in never as an alternative you know I would say yoga not a religion but say uh, I've seen Muslim people do, take up a yoga practice or Christians doing a yoga practice, Hindu people, obviously, atheists, uh, Sufi, uh, Jain, Sikh. It's really like a, a tool that many different religions traditionally could use. And that's been my experience as well. Hmm. What is the tradition of yoga that you teach or the, the lineage or style? Well, um, it's a little tricky to talk about. I mean, the simple answer is it's called the heart of yoga. The, the more complicated answer is that it's yoga. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, there's been this vast fragmentation into brands and styles in, as yoga has traveled to the West. And so now we have all these discrete uh commodified commercialized styles that we associate with different 
physical experiences. You know, you have Jiva Mukti Yoga, Iyengar Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, Yin Yoga, blah, 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 blah. And um, the basic principle of the way I learned uh, is that yoga should be adapted to each person. So you can't say, oh, it's like this and everybody has to come and do the same practice. It should be ideally adapted to a person's age and their health and their body type and their weight and their cultural background and their religion and their sensitivity and their path in life and their goals. You know, some people might have purely physical goals and some people might be uh, really deep in in their meditation practice and really want to something to help them conduct that energy so everybody's situation is very different and so you you almost can't label it as one thing but in terms of where that came from um you may have heard of krishnamacharya uh he's known as the teacher of the teachers uh, he was the teacher to Iyengar and to patabi joyce who are together the source for about 80% of modern studio yoga probably. And then you have uh, Hindu religious groups accounting for most of the rest of it. And uh, he was a really unusual, extraordinary person who's really spanned the 20th century. He was born in the uh, 19th century and didn't die till 1986. So 101 years of life really saw the whole spectrum, Indian independence, the shift from the old way into the new. And he had the equivalent of something like five or six PhDs. He was one of those um, freaks who could retain and learn a surreal, huge amount of information. And as far as people can tell from his life story in a time when it's harder to track the records he gained a huge amount of qualifications in different locations around India and then he was unhappy because his actual experience wasn't matching what he read about in the ancient texts and you know that's a whole subject of why was that lost in India why did they get to that point what the British did to India uh, what the different waves of invasion had done to tantric culture what um, the rise of more like male renunciate cults had done to yoga culture so he was looking around and it wasn't widespread or easy to find in that time and he ended up finding his teacher called Rama Mohan Brahmachari um, by Lake Manasarova in Tibet which is like this the consort of Kailash next to Mount Kailash and he stayed there about uh, seven years I think what I love about the story is surprising people that the guru lived there with his wife and children. And uh, that, that always surprises people because they have this image of the solo guy in the cave. And secondly, that he would go down to Simla, as it was then called, once a year to earn some money and then come back again to the, wherever they were. And I like that as well because it's very practical. It kind of cuts through the romantic delusion of living in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then he went back down to Mysore and he gained the patronage of the Maharaj of Mysore. And that's where he started teaching, where he taught Patabi Joyce, where he taught Iyengar, but only for 15 days, which explains why Iyengar yoga doesn't look much like what we do. And uh, then he shifted to Madras or Chennai as it now is, after the uh, dissolution of the monarchy and India's independence. So he, uh, Mark went to India in 1973 and met him then. And he was alive for a few more years, but he spent most of his time with his son, TKV Desikacha, who really like was with his father for his whole life and learned everything he had to teach. So that's one aspect and there. Some people call the yoga that came through that lineage uh, Vini yoga. We don't call it that because Desikachar observed this tendency of the Western mind to put everything in boxes and to label it. So he wrote a, a letter to his students asking them not to use that word because it, it just it sort of validated the practice of branding yoga and chopping it up 
and leaving out key aspects and things like that. And so he, he said, please, as Guru Dakshina, as, as your gift to me, don't use this mm. label. So, okay, good, we don't use that. Mm. Mm. And uh, um, the other part of the jigsaw is the influence of J. Krishnamurti and then his student, U.G. Krishnamurti. So U.G. Krishnamurti is no relation of J, but he was his student for 17 years until the point that he realized one day, like, what the hell is this guy talking about? I'm already in that state. What am I looking for? And he stood up and just walked out of the tent. And he sat down on a bench in Switzerland, looking over the valley. And this explosion happened in him. He called it the calamity he, so that people wouldn't try and duplicate it. He said it was a causal, disastrous, extremely painful, and nothing that anybody could do would make it happen. It was random. And, uh, he it was like a death experience. He died and then he kept on living. He became quite an interesting, unusual person and a good friend of Mark's after that. So that's the sort of dual influences that shape the shape the yoga. Uh, the, the practice itself from, from Krishnamacharya, Vesikacha, and then really softened by this amazing unorthodox, raging sage, uh, uh, Jiva Mukti, UG Krishnamurti. Hmm. How would you differentiate the style of yoga that you practice and teach from other styles that, you know, I've heard you criticize them as like gymnastics or something like that. Like, what, can you say more about that and expand on that? Yeah, and I need a, a disclaimer that it, it's never a personal thing on anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. Everybody is doing their best. There's like so many millions of people around the world looking into yoga now. It's dumb. Everybody's just innocently trying to feel better. And um, But I, I do get mad that what they're being offered is so inadequate that it is just duplicating the values and the unconscious patterns of our culture, which we know is harmful. Uh, so, I mean, it's a big story of what happened in that translation to the West and how yoga did become gymnastics, did become associated with exercise. If you ask people what they think of when they think of yoga, most people will think of some kind of woman in tights in a pretzel shape. <laughs> like it really doesn't invoke a fire ritual or the feeling of tenderness in your heart when you're about to kiss somebody or, you know, um, the visualization of a flower blooming in your whole body or the mantra or all the beautiful many facets of, of yoga. It's really been reduced to asana and we can't even really call it asana because the breath isn't there. The breath is missing. There's tiny lip service paid people know it's meant to be important but if you go to a most yoga classes around the world you'll be doing postures and you'll be getting into a posture and then you'll be maybe told to breathe if you're lucky it's just an overwhelming focus on the on the physicality so uh, what we do is just uh, offer a, some a practice that is within people's reach, that they're not going to classes to feel bad about themselves or to compete with the person next to them. They're not going to a class where a teacher is showing off to get their own sense of mastery, <laughs> which happens a lot as teachers doing difficult poses to show that the students can't do it. Mm. Um, it's about uh, deprogramming the body from struggle, from strength only, and about allowing it to become receptive to be able to inhale to be able to receive and for most people that happens quickly or slowly I think it's an ongoing process I feel that for myself learning how to receive and as soon as you do your actual physical practice you notice those patterns of struggle and then you're like wow okay I'm actually doing this everywhere in my whole life but this is the intervention point so I take the struggle out of my yoga and I make it just participation in life that I'm already life 
You can't make life more life. I'm not trying to get somewhere. I'm not on some crazy spiritual mission to become more as if I'm nothing already. I'm not trying to become anything. I'm abiding in myself. And so that's what I would describe yoga as intimacy with oneself, with one's body, with the breath, and then with other people as a seamless process, not like a cloistered activity that you do your yoga, feel peaceful, and then go scream at your spouse when you're done. Mm. Mm. Uh, in preparing for this conversation, I, I pulled up a number of your tweets and found one oh, about, no. about um, daily practice. And you said, I'd say that if I know if I had known then what I know now, re yoga and breathing and the importance of daily practice, then it needn't have been so dramatic. Uh, and I'm just curious to hear more about that, about your uh, daily practice and how you hold daily practice now and what you would share about that. I think I remember I was talking in the context of having seen something really horrifying about my own patterns, right? I mm. think the conversation was like about having noticed like that my entire body mind was just desperate for male attention all the time and really being forced to confront that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think I said, I felt like vomiting. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So that that's the context of that. Uh, that when I was observing that, yes, it was a safe context. Yes, it was good to see that, but I had no practice of actual uh, physical breath to sit with, to really stay with that, to move it through. I had no exhale to release it. I had no inhale to bring something new in. And yes, it was true that it was a pattern, but I didn't have a framework that my that I was more than those patterns you know so that means that when it was revealed with that uh kind of orthodox spiritual thing of uh, just deconstructing the ego or looking at your shadow whatever people want to call it I don't think it's very productive or safe or it's just overly dramatic when it's uh, not accompanied by a practice of positive identity is something much larger and more eternal and robust and beautiful and real now so that uh, you know it's safe to let go of those things it's not like oh my god my whole sense of who I am has been rocked I'm fucked you know so you were noticing a specific pattern at the time and it sort of caused you to feel like vomiting and then Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but if you'd known now what you have with a practice, it would have been uh, a smoother ride for you. Yeah. I mean, what I've noticed is that like the whole purpose of yoga is to release patterns. You know, Blake puts it as cleansing the doors of perception and yoga puts it as sometimes cleaning the pot. You know, it's a really beautiful understanding that we don't have to add things to ourselves. Actually, we're staggering burdened with so much and we just need to take it away mm. and uh, cleanse the doors, you know, and what is obstructing perception? What is obstructing me from being able to see clearly and receive the beauty and the infinity of life? My patterns, cultural frameworks and perceptual frameworks that I seamlessly absorbed growing up in our culture and uh, what I found is that there must be a practice there must be something that is actually done like pleasure but discipline of pleasure to burn those up because I mean I, I observed that pattern but then I kept doing it I saw it and then I kept doing it <laughs> it, it didn't actually release it to just see that what I'd seen. Maybe it was slightly less bad and you could say it wasn't unconscious, but uh, I don't think we should have to go digging for patterns. I think they should be gracefully moved through. It's certainly a hell of a lot easier. Can you say more about why 
a daily practice would be the thing that would help you move through these patterns skillfully? Yeah. Um, well, I think when there isn't like the discipline of something daily, then it's really easy to pretend like you're moving on your own whims and impulses all the time and that you're a free being when actually I was really being controlled by patterns, avoidance, um, a soothing, running away from feelings, you know, something wants to be felt, okay, have a snack, you know, push it down, uh, uh, get busy, uh, not making the space to, you know, step into that ring of fire and feel the thing that wants to be felt. And, you know, it's avoidance. Everybody has it. I definitely have it. And that's, if I uh, skip my practice for a couple of days, I start feeling emotionally dirty, and kind of grubby. Uh, I don't, and it just sort of cleans the air somehow by making it like a discipline. I mean, I think it's like, this is going to sound really bad, but I think it's like having sex with yourself. Whatever your practice of intimacy is, if you're a couple that never, never, never has any intimacy, any intimate time, then the relationship's going to suffer. And similarly, that's how I would see it. Hmm. it it's a time of intimacy with yourself. It's interesting that you use the word intimacy and then also discipline and, you know, talking about consistency yeah. and regularity. And I'm just curious about how yeah. you hold that of, how you do a daily practice in a way that uh, is joyful and healing and cleansing without feeling like a burden or an obligation or um, like a duty or something like that? Well, I mean, I can have all sorts of thoughts beforehand. Some, I would describe myself sometimes as like a, a thinking addict in the same way of any addiction, you know, thinking can really operate in me and I'm sure in others as a way of avoiding feeling. <laughs> and uh, like any addict, I don't want to stop. <laughs> I want to keep going, you know, I want to keep avoiding the things that that addiction has arisen to avoid. And so before a practice, definitely. Yeah. Oh, I need to do the dishes. I can't do, you know, but then I think the, the key is in the practice itself. The practice must be pleasurable, you know, it must be deeply pleasurable and deeply accessible, easy. And I would say like the first three breaths take discipline and then it's good. Like, then it's like, oh yeah, I like this. <laughs> I forgot. Again, I like this. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's so that's a you need discipline for the beginning to start out and then be, you're reminded that it's enjoyable and delightful. Yeah, and I think it gets easier over time as well. You know, all of that blah, blah, about 40 days, establish a habit. It's really true. It's, um, but the one thing I see uh, determines whether people have success or not is just how hard they are on themselves when they fall down. I mean, I just, it's taken me like, four years yeah to have a consistent practice some people pick it up straight away some people take a long time we all have different patterning we all have different avoidance strategies some people will do a practice but actually avoid themselves in the practice which is a different phenomena mm. uh so yeah i i feel like every day has to be fresh it has to be like brushing your teeth you know if you don't brush your teeth, you don't say, oh, fuck, I'm a total loser. I, I failed at brushing my teeth. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm just not cut out for it. You know, I'll leave it to the really cool people who are good at brushing their teeth. Huh. <laughs> you just feel like grosser and grosser and grosser every day as your teeth got, and then finally you'd give in and do it. <laughs> right, right. Um, what is the daily practice that you do as a yoga practitioner? Oh, man. I mean, I don't want to set up too much of a binary between practice and non-practice because mm -hmm. it's a seamless thing, right? Mm -hmm. You've said something like this, you know, that has to be 
impacting your relationships in your daily life, whatever mm -hmm. you're doing. Uh, and so it, it really ranges. I, sometimes I will literally just do whatever asana come to my mind for 10 minutes. Sometimes I'll do a longer practice. Often people have these heroic ideas of needing to do like an hour and a half, two hours, three hours of practice. Depends on the country. Often in China, particularly, people would be doing like three hours of asana every day and Russia, even worse. Wow. Uh, countries often where the schooling system has really trained them like that. And it's just not necessary. You know, it's quality, not quantity. There must be the the receptivity, the, the inhale, there must be like, uh, I don't know, I grew up playing the piano, playing music, and I grew up where you practice now for a result later. Like you play now and then you have an exam or a performance later. And that's just what the word practice came to mean for me is something you do now and then you get a different thing later. Mm. And uh, obviously I, I just stopped playing sometime because I was never really there in the music, enjoying it for its own sake. As soon as there was no more exams and no more performances, then I'd been trained on a motivation system that went flop. So I, I guess yoga is the same in that it has to be like participating in it in the moment. I have to, it has to be, something that I'm doing now and not for any kind of future result, even the future result of a better mood in half an hour's time, you know? Like, like, as soon as that comes in, then it's a manipulation. It's a trying to control the internal body into some desired outcome. And then there's a struggle going on. So it's, I'd say my practice is but just abiding in that knowledge that we are a part of life. You are the power of the cosmos. I am the power of the cosmos already. Uh, we are not trying to become anything. And I, so whatever asana and pranayama and just stillness arise, maybe chanting or whatever, uh, it has to be within that overarching practice that overarching mood of uh, not practice towards a future result but practicing the exact thing you know you practice participating and then you get better at participating <laughs> sounds so dumb but it's really not how I grew up thinking of practice it's really helpful thank you um yeah, I think I'd really like to talk quite a bit about uh, relationships and sexuality in the context of your practice and spirituality and how you understand these things. Um, I think that right. these topics are, you know, often hidden or not talked about or not discussed in spiritual communities. And uh, at least in my own path, like really integrating them and looking at them and discussing them and uh, considering them has been quite helpful. And I love the things that you've shared about these things. And um, yeah, there's a, a several questions here that I'd love to ask you. And uh, I think the uh, first one that comes to mind is really based in your story that you shared, which is, uh, you know, I've been both a student and a teacher in, you know, multiple traditions. And, uh, but in the tradition that I mainly treat in, uh, it was discouraged that students and teachers would have romantic or intimate relationships and of course different mm -hmm. traditions are different but I'm curious to hear you uh, speak to that like what what that's been like for you and uh, you know why you would date your teacher or be in an intimate relationship with your teacher and uh, how you hold that or how you think about that yeah I'm delighted that you have the courage to ask that because you know it gives me joy to talk about it I can say it's completely utterly beautiful you know sublime i sometimes i feel like i'm cheating at life because <laughs> it's like love for dummies is to be with someone who's made it their life's practice is to overcome any any patterning any reactivity 
Mm. Uh, and so it's just not possible to get into that dynamic that defines relationships so often of two people reacting against each other back and forth. Uh, I think it's a really, really fascinating topic. It's so revealing. I think it's good, the general taboo we have at this moment in time against teacher-student sexual relationship, but not because sex is bad and not because uh, that's always going to be negative, but just because of the nature of most teacher-student relationship at this moment in time and in this moment in most traditions is there is a power imbalance. Uh, there is not a uh, relaxed, natural conversation in, like the one we're having now. You know, there is a, a feeling of uh, that someone is superior and that someone is inferior and sex should not be happening if there is any kind of delusion of inferiority or superiority. Now, obviously, that's a massively difficult statement to make because every single person on the planet practically is walking around suffering from feeling inferior or superior. And so almost every sexual relationship is defined by someone feeling inferior and someone feeling superior. I mean, I look back to different relationships that I had in my life and purely because of the male-female dynamic, I assumed I was less. And some of those relationships were with people that in hindsight, I was not truly wanting to be with, but I'd given them some authority in some way, whether it was just through their maleness or it was some combination of their professional role or just my admiration of their skills and qualities mixed with my own low self-esteem, then the assumption would be there that they are superior and therefore trying to please them starts to get weighted more importantly than being true to my own autonomous lust and impulses and bodily autonomy. So you hit, you know, like, I mean, I was trained from a young age as we all are to depress our bodily autonomy for the sake of someone else's agenda. You know, don't go to the toilet when you need to in school. Uh, do this at this time don't do that and so that translates very effortlessly to relationship so when I look at around I don't see the sex as the problem I see the power imbalance itself as the problem and especially for a spiritual so-called teachers because there should not be a power imbalance in between a teacher and a student for, for there to be any sincere tra transmission and transformation there must be trust and friendship and equality and mutuality. You know, I've had a teacher who I assumed to be superior to me and he was very happy to uh, perpetuate the story that if anybody thought he was superior, that was their problem. That was their projection. However, he was still sitting on a throne. <laughs> he was still wearing special clothes. He still had a special name. Uh, he had not really taken responsibility for his part in that uh, dynamic. And yes, people bring those mental structures of power with them and they project it on the teacher, but the teacher must take some responsibility for that because if you assume someone is more powerful or more important or more spiritual or something than you are, you're not yourself around them. I mean, think about how weird you or anyone or me might have acted with someone who we assume to be really 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 amazing if there's an assumption of a difference in power we don't say our deepest darkest feelings we don't interact normally we don't show ourselves we try and perform what we think that important person wants you know and psychotherapists know this that's why a good psychotherapist they need many sessions with a with a someone they're treating to establish a relationship of trust and mutuality where both are looking at their own behavior, you know? So uh, I think the fact that there's been so many dysfunctional, abusive and traumatic misuses of power by so-called spiritual teachers uh, is mainly a problem about power in general in a spiritual setting. And it's just not appropriate. And it shows you that something is not happening because where does that assumption of power come from? It's in the mind, right? Like if 
even if I'm sitting next to some kind of world leader, the assumption of them being an intrinsically superior person is, is wrong. It's, it's a mental structure that we might both be participating in. It's not true. And I want my spiritual practice to be something that is grounded in truth, that is not about mental structures. I want it to be very directly about perception of reality. And uh, so if I'm, if I'm not able to step out of a power structure, then what the hell kind of a spiritual practice is it anyway? If it's not offering me a way to be with other people without those delusions of power, and that has to be real, not just a teacher saying, well, if you think I'm more powerful, then you're deluded. And I think it must be like impeccable caution on the part of a teacher to not allow anyone to pin that on them. You know, as I find Yuji Krishnamurti an incredible example here. If someone would try and touch his feet, he would try and touch their feet and they'd both shuffle around in this one kind of game. <laughs> And he would say, the dust on my feet's no different from the dust on your feet. What's the big deal? <laughs> like, just over and over, relentlessly refusing to allow people to continue in their assumption that he was superior and that they needed to become more like him or please him. I think that's integrity, you know. And I think that if that integrity is there, which allows actual relationship, uh, total comfort where everyone can be themselves, then it's completely natural for a, for a relationship to arise if it's mutual, if it's empowered, if it's um, beautiful and fulfilling to both people, if it's not at all about anybody using the other person to try and get anything. And there's sublime examples of this for us in history, you know, like Padmasambhava, Yeshi Sogyal, I only really learned about her in the last few years being in Tibet. And we've mostly heard of Padmasambhava and we were familiar with his moustache if people have looked into Buddhism at all. But he died relatively young, you know, and it was her who spread his teachings all throughout Tibet, uh, obviously misogynistic times. So she did it by discovering turtong or hidden treasures that he had laid down, but they're coming through her. And uh, it's really celebrated all around Tibet. There are these beautiful golden statues of the Yab Yum figure, you know, the sexual embrace. Uh, we went to one tower where the, the lower levels were all just single deities and um, uh, different figures, different abbots and things. And then there was like a locked door and we had to uh, bribe the guard for the roof repair fund, like everyone putting all this money towards the roof. <laughs> and then he unlocked this little door, it was like one meter high and let us go up into the upper levels. And they're all full of sexual embrace, like absolutely stunning, beautiful paintings around all the walls. And they lock them away because culture has changed. You know, it, there is no longer a flourishing culture, as far as I know, anywhere in the world where sex is really a scene in a sane, healthy, beautiful, uh, healthy, <laughs> said that again already, kind of way. And um, there were obviously there were some groups of monks and things that were only engaging with that at a visualization or a conceptual level, but they were also practicing as a, a literal, a literal physical practice and sure we have some traditions now and maybe back then that had nefarious sexual practices or about using other people to get power or to um to take their energy for oneself but we also have stunningly beautiful ones we can tell from their poetry that's come down to us and i, I mean there's one tantra scholar christopher wallace and he describes that period the sexual culture of that period is one of the lost wonders of the world. Why would, <clears throat> why would sexuality be something that is uh, seen as good or healthy or beautiful from a perspective of spiritual practice rather than bad and shameful and evil or something like that? Oh my God. 
so I should confess here, we actually, we did a book, the book I mentioned at the start. Mm -hmm. The book is called God and Sex, Now We Get Both, uh -huh. <laughs> which several publishers were too scared to do with that title. Mm -hmm. Why were they scared? You know, because we live in a world where those are maybe the two most loaded, scary words. Mm -hmm. God, ah, sex, ah. And people's experience with both of them has been pretty uniformly dreadful traumatic abusive um dualistic so what do we get when we divide the world into the sacred above and the material below we said sex is not sacred right we said it was lesser was degraded and then of course we end up with a world where sex is degraded and lesser because it's been assumed to be left out of the wholeness of life you have i mean we're coming at the end of thousands of years of monks and popes <laughs> who are who have pushed celibacy as a spiritual ideal on the public with the deep belief that uh that sex was degraded that it was lesser i mean that wasn't even uh that wasn't even the rule in in christianity i think for the first few hundred years and then they were losing property to the offspring and so then it became a rule but the problem goes so deep, you know, that sex is corrupted. And when it's treated like that, it becomes like that, you know. It's like our world. We look around. What do we think we end up with when you assume that nature is dead matter or resource, dead materiality? Then you just use it. You abuse it. So what are we doing to each other's bodies in the conventional sex? It's the exact same dynamic of treating another person's body like a resource, something to get something from something to take from, something to maybe be into for the aesthetics, but to use and to ultimately degrade, to um, compromise the wildness of it, to burden it with toxicity. You know, I, I, the, the landscape in our bodies are definitely suffering from the same, same thing. That makes a lot of sense. Uh... I just love hearing you talk about that because I, uh, yeah, I've had an intuition for some time in my own life of sex not being something ugly or evil or something like that. Um, but it's really beautiful to hear you speak to why we would think that and also why it might not be so. Yeah. And I, you know, I grew up with the understanding that you, no one ever told me this, but I grew up in a culture where you use sex to try and get love. Mm. That sex, it wouldn't be like you'd go out with someone and you wait until you really feel love for each other. You start having sex quite rapidly and then you try and see if love comes out of that. Mm. <laughs> and that wasn't a conscious choice is the point. That was just the funnel that I found myself going down uh, growing up I'm not sure of myself growing up in a culture of the objectification of our bodies then this seemed like my body was currency and it was something I could use to try and get love get approval get all the things I thought were lacking and uh, get attention get um, get a good feeling from someone else you know outsourcing all the responsibility to make me feel good in life to another person and if only they could love me and be behaving exactly as I wanted <laughs> then then I would be able to be happy. And obviously like that pressure that is being put on sexual relationships, which is makes them implode because nobody can uh, fill that hole in another person, sorry to be accidentally vulgar, but that should be filled by their sense of belonging in the world, by their autonomous sense of value and worth and um, and being, loved and lovable and and i'm not saying everybody has to have that all sorted because i do think we're hurt in relationship and we heal in relationship but the normal kind of unconscious thing is just two people trying to suck each other dry until one gets angry and calls it quits <laughs> mm -hmm. one of the most powerful things that i've seen you say on this um is about uh boundaries and 
sexuality and uh, I've been doing a lot of reflecting on this topic myself in recent years and so I really appreciated what you had to say. Um, I'll just read it here. You say, I'm going to say something controversial. You should only have sex with those you love and who love you. By should, I don't mean conform to my values. I mean, for the sake of our own energy, emotions, heart, no one is judged here, only a certain path, passionately recommended. And you go on to say this isn't like a religious or conservative moral view. It's You say it on behalf of your body's in energetic integrity from first principles. The depth of what happens in sex is massively underestimated. You take on all the karmas of another person and then uh, that love is the fire that enables these karmas to be burnt up. And I am very, very sympathetic to this claim. I myself have believed for some time that uh, what happens in sex is massively underestimated and that there's some kind of karmic impact there of having sex with someone else. Uh, but I would love to hear you elaborate on this and share your own sense of it, of like why sex would have an energetic or karmic dimension when that's something that I imagine is not obvious to most people. Mm. Yeah, it, you can tell from the defensive language that I'm weaving in there that I mm -hmm. know it's a dicey subject mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you know, we are stepping out of only recently a period of sexual control and repression and rules for the wrong reasons. So I'm not coming from a position of like, we should go back to rules and we should go back to uh, strict control of other people's sexuality, not at all. And I think everyone's a little like cagey and paranoid about anybody using words like should or seeming to control sexuality because we are still emerging from uh, cultures that really try and do that, that um, see, for example, female desire as a threat, as a something that needs to be covered up or controlled or strictly regulated, um, uh, that, that really sees sex as bad. Sex is a bad, evil, disruptive force that needs to be very tightly controlled and hopefully squashed down to a polite little ring around the calendar once a month with your married partner. <laughs> and, you know, obviously that's a repellent to most younger or feeling kind of people. And so we think, well, sex is not bad. So therefore we're not going to follow those rules. We're going to do what we want. We're going to have sex with whoever we want. And um, I have discovered and what my friends have discovered as well is like that adolescent reaction to the restrictions that went before uh, is not the answer. <laughs> you know, we need to be autonomous here. We need to be making our own decisions, not just making the opposite decision to what happened before that. Otherwise we're still shaped by the past, but just like an inverted, the other side of the coin. And to me, to read this phrase that I first read in, in Yoga of Heart, that sex is the communication of love, it really landed. I just intuitively felt that that was true. Like, okay, I, I understand that. And I think anyone who has felt what real intimacy can do for sex, like how intimacy, how love from the heart can move the sexual current around the body, so much more effectively than any kind of physical stimulation, no matter what that is, uh, has got a sense of what we're talking about. And yeah, I say it again, it's not a judgment on absolutely anyone and it's not saying what anyone should do. It's just saying uh, we really need to come to terms with the fact that we are in a numb state. You know, you don't know what you don't know. When I was in academia, I had no idea that I was numb from here down. I didn't know you were meant to experience life with your whole body feeling. I didn't know that you're not meant to feel kind of like all the time. <laughs> we're so adaptable. You just adapt and you think it's normal and you find other friends who feel like that. And then you read books by other people who feel like that. And you go on forums where other people feel like that. <laughs> and if there's any shame there, then 
the the reaction is to justify it to justify it like we need to normalize feeling like shit all the time okay we we need to stop feeling ashamed of it but let's not normalize it when it's possible for us to feel sublimely benevolently harmlessly good you know uh let's let's just keep that in mind as our birthright as our human option <laughs> and so uh what i look, see when i look around is a vast human culture of numbness numbness all all around i mean when we when i was on rainbow warrior we were chasing pirate fishing ships and i don't know what i expected from my understanding of pirates <laughs> but it was it's like very small boats with a usually Chinese uh, captain and mate, and then really poorly paid, basically slave labor of uh, Indonesian or Fijian or um, Thai crew. And the Thai crew, they didn't look sort of downtrodden and depressed the way I'd been expecting. They were drinking monster energy drinks and playing pumping dance music as they were pulling in the fish and slicing off the turtles heads and throwing them back in the water like the only way they could participate in killing as a job uh, indiscriminately and in shark finning etc was by numbing themselves it's quite beautiful really because it shows you what naturally sensitive creatures we are that we have to even do that you know we can't just kill without numbing ourselves and um, when you look at the activities we're doing we're constantly numbing ourselves understandably but what it means is that when we come to each other sexually there's a numbness there which means that the significance of what's going on is not felt but it's still happening <laughs> it's still going on uh you know we there's so much we don't know about how humans work we're so beautiful so mysterious the way energy moves through the body is not at all understood by Western medicine, for example. I mean, you have these vast cultures in China and India and other places recognizing us as um, multidimensional, subtle beings and that have actually caught up with physics in terms of seeing matter as just part of the spectrum of energy. And that there's a whole spectrum there from gross to subtle that is that we're living on. Um, uh, that's not me being woo, you know, that's uh, just where physics is at these days, what we're kind of still living and formed by Newton. And um, even if we think we're coming with another person casually and that we're just having some kind of mutual masturbation genital friction on each other or we're just grabbing for someone in the means of alcohol to feel better like there is a there is a merge that happens in sexual embrace there where you do just through some law some flow like the way water flows their energies do flow into you and love is the way that those things normally can be burned up and and purified you know two people enter into a relationship together saying okay we're gonna we're going to uh we're going to commit to each other to uh, purify our patterns together let's go, let's build a bonfire together of the force of being together and let's um throw everything that doesn't serve us and serve humanity on that fire together and what are you going to do if you have all that rotten wood of, and no fire you know it's going to get pretty messy pretty quickly uh, and you know i always felt i guess embarrassed to admit that commitment seemed like something beautiful to me I had swallowed the spiritual ideal of non-attachment and translated that unskillfully into the spiritual realm. And so I thought it was not very spiritual or um, to, like worldly to actually value commitment and continuity with another person. And 
I've just seen so many conversations on this subject. It's like the number one source of drama and confusion <laughs> is that, yeah, of course, it's attachment to try and force someone to be committed to you who doesn't want to be. <laughs> but what we're talking about is two people who want to be together and then me having the self-respect to only be with someone who actually also really wants to be with me rather than trying to have sex first and then hope that they get, get with the program later. They might not be capable of intimacy. They might not be at that stage in their life. They might not be interested. They might not actually click with my personality. You know, uh, I find it hilarious that I could find myself in this position of apparently advocating this conservative argument, like, uh, what would happen if we went on dates and like really got to know each other as friends and then waited until we felt love in our hearts, like a warm caramel feeling when we looked at a person and then just felt intuitively that move down into our genitals and felt like we wanted to express that love sexually and, and that we weren't in a hurry, we weren't rushing, we weren't trying to do tension release we weren't trying to just get off. We weren't like greedily going for our own orgasm. We weren't like um, thinking about how do I look and trying to perform for another person. What if it could be like this beautiful river flowing between two people and they could just be both swimming in it together without any consciousness about how the body looks or what noises it makes or, you know, I think sex can be the most beautiful, powerful meditation if it's used correctly because um, you know love moves the energy moves the life force uh, Krishnamacharya our teacher you know he was a very orthodox Brahmin kind of guy I doubt the word sex ever passed his lips but he did say if you want to know about the chakras don't learn about the chakras look at your wife <laughs> hmm. Hmm. there's so much here that I'd love to ask you about I, I think um want to zoom in on you're saying that the world is not just matter and there are other dimensions of experience and uh assuming that someone is receptive to that worldview which some people aren't why why would it be that um sex would be especially partaking in energy exchange rather than something else. Like I could see someone saying, oh, you know, when you spend a lot of time with someone, then you, you know, exchange patterns, you become more like them. And sex is just an instance of that, but it's not special. But uh, it seems like you're saying there's something special about the sexual connection and intimacy that uh, has some kind of energetic exchange or karmic exchange even. Yeah, I mean, I'm, maybe it's some kind of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. The way I think of it is like that, you know, if you have empathy or sensitivity to a person and you look at them even and you, st you start to feel what they're feeling, uh, and, but that is actually happening whether we are conscious of it or not, is that we affect each other. You know, if, if one person is very aggressive uh, my sister is a great example because she is on the autistic spectrum I mean probably the whole family is but she is the one who's visibly readably there and so she hid the rest of us mm. and um, she uh, can't like label or name the emotion that people are feeling around her but she definitely feels people's vibes you know she absolutely does and she doesn't actually let social patterning over over program her she always had better taste in my boyfriends than I did <laughs> she would I would break up with somebody who had been dating in the film scene or whatever and she would say after this two-year relationship had ended I never liked him he couldn't uh -huh. laugh at himself I'm like Hazel now you tell me uh -huh. <laughs> you know and so the reason I say that is because even if we can't label the emotion or, or consciously sense it, we are absolutely picking up on these things. Just the same way uh, 
all animals pick up on each other. The horses and horses and dogs pick up on the mood of a human. What is actually going on there? You know, they're feeling something about that that human, and they're not just they're thinking about it; they're actually receiving it. They're actually um, we are not separate. You know, we are affected by each other. So sure, that's happening even if we're just talking. We could say that. Uh, the sex, it, like intimate, being with people, the vulnerability of that and the actual act of union seems to be the strongest form of that that I know. Uh, maybe being with someone dying, I don't know, maybe birth, I'm not sure. But it seems to be very, very potent um, where just their their energy field, and I don't mean it in a theoretical way, but just the thing we know it to be already, that what we are receiving from somebody, we receive it completely, you know. Even if we are stiff, even if we are numb, even if there isn't a conscious feeling of that. Uh, I think at some level people have they know that they have experienced that there's an interesting book about hookup culture on campus and how the image in the movies is of kind of all these sexy times and and people's this book was interviewing people and finding out how they really felt about hookup culture and they were not happy they did not actually like it they were all secretly longing for something with more intimacy and actually feeling used and traumatized by each other and um, it's kind of, in some cultures, quite uncool to admit that. You're sort of meant to be cool with it, you know? If you look at the hookup cultures of uh, Thailand and Bali and other places, I've spoken to so many people in those transient places who fell for somebody, felt ashamed because they weren't being non-attached and it was meant to be fun and let's just see how it goes. Um, they didn't really have any thought to wait and see if the other person had any real intentions towards um, being with them. And I'm not saying every relationship has to last forever. Maybe there are some things that are meant to be short and pure and loving and then you part lovingly and you stay in touch. I don't know. I think that's valid. It's not like anybody should feel a failure when a relationship ends. Serial monogamy is our norm for most people. But uh, the transmission of energy, yeah, I. this is why I teach yoga, because yoga gives us the sensitivity. So nobody should believe what I am saying. They should just um, do any kind of practice that enables us to feel more and then find out like a scientist make it an experiment i mean we do know that we're numb because we're feeling bad everybody wants to feel better and to be more feeling to have more feeling intelligence to be able to be with themselves you know and uh you know this very popular teach women's yoga around the world I think the best thing you could do for women would be to teach men yoga because mm -hmm. predominantly they're sleeping with the men <laughs> and uh, that would be extremely beneficial because often men are just to generalize more culturally uh, pushed into numbness and more repressed in the feeling department. Um, not to say women are channeling their feelings in a helpful, healthy way, but often um, men find that they are really have been shut down by all those things we know about the ideal of the staunch guy and all of that. I don't know, maybe you can say more about that. Hmm. Well, it reminds me of, uh, it seems to me that doing extensive meditation practice and also monastic training uh, was beneficial to me as a man and certainly as a partner as well. And uh, without, mm, I, I think it made me more prepared than a lot of men my age in my culture to be 
a good partner and to be intimate and kind and attentive to people and things like that, that uh, mm -hmm. are skills that now seem like, uh, you know, these should just be basic. It's not special or something, but are not well distributed or common. Uh, yeah, so I think I, I like the point of like men, men, men can benefit from these trainings and that that would be a good, good thing to do for women to, yeah. Yeah, and it's not to say that women don't also need to become receptive in whatever way they choose to do that, you know, mm -hmm. like this is all of us, but I just noticed there's a particular culture of I'm going to help women by doing uh, period trainings. I think uh -huh. we could help women by teaching men to uh, feel their own energy and take responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll be really able to love. Part of your the argument that I hear you making is that um, which which again I'm I'm very sympathetic to I just want to understand how you see it more carefully um, is that we're most of us in contemporary culture are numb and that as we uh, do practices we can become more sensitive to these other dimensions of experience and you know they're not like magical or mystical or something they're just things that are very ordinary that you start to become more attuned to. And you can see for yourself in experience uh, that there are these kinds of uh, exchanges that are happening in sexuality, that it's a particularly potent form of um, interacting with other people where you do kind of exchange patterns, energy, karma, however you wanna frame it. And part of why I'm asking is from noticing these things myself, but I'd be curious to hear you know, your own experience of these things, what you, you know, if you have any notable memories of starting to be attuned to these dimensions of intimacy where, you know, uh, you started to these, see these things for yourself, you know, I, I could imagine someone making these same claims from a perspective of dogma or, you know, uh, religion or tradition, and, you know, you're saying we've rightly stepped away from those deep things, but that we need to go back a little bit more and that this is from experience from seeing it for yourself and so i'd be curious to hear about your experience of it like if you have any specific memories of something that you noticed where intimacy or sexuality or just being around people really uh, affected you in a way that made you reorient towards these things yeah wow well there's a lot of examples I can think of, both positive and negative. I definitely have found it quite harrowing at times to really feel the extent of what's going on in sex for most of us and for myself in the past and to really uh, grieve what that numbness does and what those power dynamics do. Um, I think it's like pretty normal for a couple to not be able to tell what the other one is feeling while they are actually uh, making love. And I think that's surreally dysfunctional. I mean, it's unworkable. That's why we've got so many disastrous communication breakdowns now. And we're trying to compensate with language for something which should be our natural ability you know uh i remember i remember before i ever um encountered yoga uh, uh i was with my partner at the time and my mind just shifted i wasn't interested in whatever we were doing together at the time and he could feel that he could feel it because he was a sensitive kind of person in some ways and it was so and so, of course, we immediately changed what we were doing. It would not have been right to continue in a sexual kind of moment when the mood had shifted. And, you know, at the same time, I didn't have the ability to stay in my mood. I didn't have the ability to focus my mind. So it's a hazard as well. But uh, I was really struck by that moment because it showed me that every time that that had happened in the past through all my relationships 
what had actually happened in that moment where my autonomous feeling shifted out of a sexual space is that probably most of the time I just continued along with some physical charade of sex whilst not actually still being in the experience of free choice like that's what I would call a, a pattern and it like that is traumatizing for for all of us is that we are um, with the general uh, approach of mind over body we have the ability to push ourselves through with things that maybe we feel like oh we went home with someone but now we don't want to hurt their feelings oh well we don't want to they haven't orgasmed yet so we don't want to stop because then they'll be angry uh, all of those social fears informing the sex and preventing clear communication and now just think of the 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 harm that is being done to individuals by overriding our natural impulses like that i mean one of the most traumatic things that can ever happen to any person is when someone else forcefully overrides their natural impulses and but this is the general approach that we are taking to our own sexuality is to override our natural impulses to be polite or to be loved or to be not a nuisance or to be not weird or to be perceived in a certain way or whatever it is so uh, feeling the potential there that really um, urgently <laughs> we must um, activate that ability in every person to sense what their partner is feeling I don't think that respectful um, beautiful sex is possible until that ability is there um, and it's kind of horrific if you really think into the implications of the fact that that ability has been overridden I don't think it's a skill we need to learn children are very sensitive to each other's feelings and very sensitive to the feelings of adults and then we gradually are deliberately desensitized so that we can fit other people's agendas Are there any experiences that you would share of the heights or beauties of connection that's possible when you are really attuned to yourself and your partner and there is that love there? Well, I, I think we have to be careful that even talking about like say numbness and sensitivity doesn't create any kind of hierarchy, mm -hmm. like that nobody is trying to like improve themselves and become better. I mean, there is so much neuroticism caught up in sex. The most neurotic I have ever been about anything was things to do with my sexuality. Uh -huh. I, thought, I thought that I couldn't orgasm for many years and I was so, so ashamed about it. Mm. The, one, the first time I ever spoke about it in public, I was nearly like vomiting with nervous fear. Mm. Uh, and it was, I was wrong. I had been all along. It just hadn't been a full body experience that I was expecting. It was like a perfect meditation story of what happens when you have an image of what you think you should be feeling. And I think it was a beautiful intuition because my experience is that it's true that orgasm should not be a tension release. Again, I'm saying should, but uh, I don't mean it like a prescription or a judgment. I mean, like, let's talk about our potentiality is that... Uh, uh, energy should be free to flow in the body and our patterns are like blocks in the river like rocks and if you imagine rocks in the river and then the, the water flows and it splashes and then you just end up having a down and out depleting kind of orgasm and uh, I'm not talking here about learning any kind of technique this is not like a neo-tantra kind of like lurid technique conversation to me it's about um, uh, honoring devotionally our own prana our, you know being devoted to life in our own form to the extent that we want it to flow beautifully we just like we'd clean up the rubbish from the river near our house we want to clear up our own river so it can flow and be fresh and clean and then it really can flow through the whole 
body and be so much more pleasurable than just a physical sensation and so much more um uh, even the word pleasure is, is very kind of, we associate it with pretty limited kind of sensation, I think. Um, I think that uh, sex can be a generative force. Like we talk about making love as a kind of euphemism because we don't want to say sex, but it could literally be making love. I know you are all about meta, sending love to people. Well, where are you getting it from? you know hmm. yeah uh, it's it's flowing from your heart and and i find that uh, a regenerative redemptive sexuality is like um allowing that spring in the heart to just flow freely and clearly and um that partners can be together as a kind of worship of one another and really a, a communication of love and not at all like rushed or with the sort of um, aggression that comes through in most bodies you see in the movies in some kind of a sexual embrace. Incidentally, I took my sister to a movie once that had a sex scene in it and she hadn't seen many. And uh, <laughs> she's, we're in the movie theater and she sees the guy kind of like thrusting himself all over the woman and she yells leave her alone <laughs> <laughs> wow wow because she could feel the uh pent-up aggression in his movements mm -hmm. <laughs> which mm -hmm. is very interesting mm -hmm. that is fascinating zooming out and a again bit. you know it, yeah. it's a little tricky to have this conversation because i would say mm -hmm. it, it needs to take place not in the context of some kind of ideal, but in the context of practice, like that our practice itself is what uh, releases aggression, unpacks compressed energies, um, releases patterning, and then allows us to be natural with another person and not just uh, grunting. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Zooming out a little bit, uh, what advice or suggestions would you give to anyone who is some kind of spiritual practitioner cares about being present and attuned and developing themselves spiritually who is interested in romantic relationships oh man um well, firstly i would say um beware on both sides <laughs> Beware of um, neo-tantric vulgarity convincing you that you need to use sex to try and feel something or use another person to try and accomplish something. Like you don't need to. It's perfectly okay to just be me in the universe. You know, in fact, sometimes being single can be a great benefit because then you don't have to deal with someone else's karmas as well as your own. Intersecting, <laughs> magnifying. And then on the other side, to beware of the discourse around non-attachment and um, the valuation of ambitious celibacy. Celibacy comes naturally for a very few people, but I've met many young people who are being ambitiously celibate. They're trying to achieve something spiritually by cutting out their sex. And normally they've just been hurt in relationship and an ambitious celibacy is a sneaky way to try and avoid that happening again. Mm. It's not going to work. You know, we mm. have to deal with it. We have to deal with where we are stuck, which is in the root, in the base. Our sex is where we are stuck. And if we go off to a cave by ourselves and meditate and feel very peaceful, and then we just like the story we know, come down and keep interacting with people in dysfunctional ways. You know, I know quite a few people who have avoided relationship because relationship shows us our patterns. And if you're noticing that, then it might seem easy to just back out like, okay, I'm out. I don't want to see that. Put the lid back on Pandora's box. Do, do, do. They're still there. They're still absolutely there. The relationship was a blessing in that it showed them <laughs> that it, it revealed them. 
there's a saying I really like, which is love brings up everything that is unlove to be seen and understood. And um, I think it's a really fiery, beautiful practice. And again, <laughs> to flip back to the other side, we are absolutely patterned into wanting a relationship for the wrong reasons because we're scared of being alone, lonely, social pressure, the sense of someone to fulfill us, blah, blah, blah. And then to flip to the other side, but we are animals and we are having a natural yearning to, to mate and to be with someone and we are designed for that. And that is completely normal and shouldn't be demonized by any kind of spiritual philosophy. I think the best we can do is... Uh, uh, make sure that we have some kind of, of practice of sensitizing to our own autonomous directions, our own lust, our own love, our own like, our own completely idiosyncratic personality and body and feeling what it wants and not being afraid to leave a relationship, even if maybe it hurts somebody or um, to tell someone how we feel or to take the risk of saying, hey, I really like you. Um, I'm, I'm interested in a container of continuity and commitment. Are you interested in that? And having the dignity and self-respect to say no if, if someone isn't interested in that and not just hoping that they will come around. You know, I was always too scared to say that for a long time because I just thought I had to take what I could get. It's just a classic symptom of low self-esteem. Whereas really, it's such a blessing to say what you want. <laughs> as long as it's not like, I want you to buy me five gifts every day and always agree with everything I say and never argue with me ever. <laughs> mm -hmm. But when it's a real desire of the heart and not of the demanding mind, then to really state it, um, it's good if they want it to, and it's good if they don't want it and disappear because then you find out straight away. Is there anything that's related to any of the topics that we've discussed that you'd like to say more about or dive into more? Oh my God. Um, well, I just... I was talking to a friend earlier and she was feeling dismayed to be struggling in this area mm. and we were just agreeing that like everybody is this is like a very very messed up moment in time for relationship i've never lived in any other time so i can't compare but it is very very hard in this moment in time is to sustain a loving intimate polarity and uh, with between two people it's a real accomplishment and nobody should give themselves a hard time if it's not arising or if it's uh, dis dissolving currently I mean it's one of the most profoundly painful things we go through and it's not really uh, acknowledged as such because often there's shame and sense of failure involved wow breakups are painful they're like a death sometimes. I know on your Twitter, you say that uh, you're willing to give people breakup support <laughs> if they need it. And what kind of support do you tend to give people if they are going through a breakup? Oh, man. You know, I, I just wrote that for like a past version of me. Mm. I remember being 21 years old and I knew I had maybe you had to break up with my boyfriend I remember googling like how do you tell if you love somebody or like mm. how to cure heartbreak like why was I looking to anonymous help on the internet in that moment <laughs> I think mm. a lot of people have done that why do we do that because sometimes it's the strongest most powerful thing we've ever felt it's caught up with sex so there may be we don't want to talk with our family about it often some people have a better relationship than I did maybe and uh, so if there is anybody out there who is feeling what I was feeling in that moment I just want to be like a little flag being like 
hey, I've survived a lot of breakups. I've learned a lot along the way. And there are definitely things you can do in your understanding of it and to make it a lot less painful because we give ourselves such a hard time in breakups. If we've been living out the conventional relationship thing where the other person's love and desire is the stake in the ground that we've chosen for our self-esteem, then when that stake is removed, it's like a structural collapse. We've invested in a bad uh, investment. You know, we put all our money into this bank and this bank has collapsed and we're completely broke. We've got no self-esteem left. And uh, it's a very vulnerable moment. And yeah, I just, um, I love it when someone sends me a message and takes up that invitation. I love it when people are so courageous and vulnerable. And often in those moments when something breaks, they're like a portal, you know, there's a huge potential in those moments because things are so bad that we're not pretending anymore. We're just honest. And in that honesty, it's very, very powerful. And often things are revealed to ourselves about ourselves, about our patterns, about, but often we're seeing them, but we're only negative about them. Like, oh my God, I'm a fucking loser. I drove them away. No wonder they left, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. Hmm. What kind of support or advice do you find yourself giving to people to support them in that time? Mostly just asking them questions, just listening, like, wow, what happened? Mm. Like, oh, uh, and often when people just articulate that and put it into words, then it's, um, it's a useful process. And sometimes I'll just share something from my experience that was like that or that how it felt with a little bit of time going past. And I believe people heal themselves. I wouldn't say I'm doing anything for anybody. But I mean, it would probably be frowned on in some quarters. It's like, oh, she's not a counselor. She's not a psychologist or something. I really resist that over-professionalization of friendship, you know, because you could meet someone in a cafe and be talking that evening and you could, would you have to have a qualification to do that? You know, mm -hmm. do you need a degree to be a friend? Do you need to sign a, a special agreement? <laughs> I think you can make ourselves available in friendship for people as long as we're not um, power tripping or assuming any kind of superiority or any kind of, um, role you know mm. yeah I, that's definitely how i see the offer that you're making is just like being willing to be a good friend to someone uh who needs it at a time that they need it i don't know if it's actually helpful uh i hope so uh, yeah a couple people said it was so i'm glad about that it tends to be more natural when there's already an existing relationship there i mm. find myself for that role mostly more with people i already know mm -hmm. And on Twitter, it's more anonymous. And so it's more like a, um, just a flag that's out there in case anybody is, hasn't got other options. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very kind of you to make that offer. Well, it's an honor. I mean, you must know this when you're with people, when they're in a, a vulnerable state, it's so real, it's so beautiful. Mm. It's a real privilege to talk or chat or anything with someone who's going through an intense feeling like that. Totally, totally. Is there anything else that you'd like to share or speak about? No, I mean, I'm very grateful to you for being so willing to um, take this neutral role and really ask questions and help me articulate basically where some of these things are coming from some things I've never tried putting into words before. So I really appreciate that. Mm, I'm so glad. I don't know. I think uh, I really appreciated hearing where you're coming from and you're speaking about a lot of things that I think many people are curious about, but few talk about. So uh, yeah. I really appreciate you sharing them. I Talking about relationship, I always have this sense of inadequacy, not of me, but of 
the conversation because it's just so vast and there's so many things we could go into I feel like opened a little box and just chose a few points at random and um, there's just so much there and there's so much difficulty there which really we could shine a light on but mm -hmm. that's a, another time hmm. I mean to some extent you have to discover it for your, your for yourself from your own experience as you've been talking about and but I think it really totally. helps to have someone just kind of like a mature friend or like an older brother or older sister type person to just be like hey here's how i see it and what my experience has been like and how i think about it and just to share yeah. the wisdom that you've seen from it yeah and it's helped me a lot in my life just to have a sense of what's possible because mm -hmm. you know, as a younger woman i was just surrounded by other people suffering the same things as i was and so i wasn't motivated to look for the things that would help so the only things that were motivating me was my own pain mm -hmm. <laughs> So thank God for that because mm -hmm. it's a good motivator. But yeah, I just really want everyone to know that like intimate relationship can be peaceful, like a, a love battery that is charging your life and not this kind of vortex drain of energy where you're constantly like rubbing against each other and demanding things from each other. And it can be like sublimely beautiful sense of um ongoing connection whether you're connected physically or not a current that moves between you it can it can really be uh, valued as the most important thing in life and that doesn't have to be a needy um clingy kind of thing it can be a profound ancient beautiful thing and if anybody is uh wanting relationship they should not be ashamed of that hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that just now and also for everything that you've shared with us today. I really enjoyed speaking with you, Rosalind. So thank you for coming on. Oh, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And we both even have faces. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I. It really helps to put a face to people's ideas and words and teachings. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.